All right, so today we're going to end our three-month series on space. And as per request, someone wanted me to go into the Artemis program. Artemis is a little bit of controversial uh, topic, and you can't talk about Artemis or talk about Orion or SLS without talking about politics. So unfortunately, a little bit of this is going to be your civics lesson. <laughs> And I'll try and not be boring or stray too far from, you know, the fun part about rockets and blowing things up and shooting to the moon and everything. So Artemis back to the moon or boldly going where we've been before. So Artemis, why did they pick Artemis? Well, Artemis was the Greek goddess of the forest and hills, also of the hunt and the moon. So they probably picked Artemis in light of the fact that they're already training female crew members to go to the moon. And I think that's awesome. That's gonna be fantastic to you know, diversify our NASA exposure in terms of astronauts. Uh, I remember back in my day, it was highly publicized when we had the first shuttle astronauts being female. And, uh, and that was super cool. So why go back to the moon? This is the part where you might be a little bored, but I'll try and make it as interesting as possible. We're going back to the moon mainly because of politics. Manned space endeavor for NASA and for everyone dreaming has always been to be interplanetary. From Werner von Braun all the way to today, to Elon Musk or whoever, they all want to be able to transit our solar system and have humans explore other planets. You can think back to like, you know, Columbus days or even the Vikings. They were trapped on their shorelines and they got in their boats and they wanted to explore. And where did they want to go to? Far off islands that were mysterious and you could see or you bump into but you haven't landed on. So it's that same sense of exploration, that same sense of going. Uh, it's one of the things that drove us to go to the moon. And uh, Mars is now the next main target. Uh, but you know, in that endeavor and in pushing to have that be a part of NASA's program in the in the 90s and into the thousands, the cost and the reality of going to Mars is quite prohibitive at this point. And I know if you've been with this series the whole time, our, one of our first lectures or second lectures, we did a section on Mars, should we colonize it or not? And in there, we talked about radiation and living conditions and how hard it is to get there, you know, and all those things. So when those things became a reality and when congressional members look at budgets, they think about getting reelected. And when Mars looked less likely to presidents and congressmen, it began to be NASA's non-big focus. After the shuttle was deemed way too expensive. You know, the manned space endeavor got a little bit more lease on life to try and exit the planet's low Earth orbit. Uh, most of the focus, though, remained with exploratory missions like robotic probes to Mars and things like that. So Mars got expensive. Let's look, though, over here. I know this is small. I'll just point to a few states, though. Hawaii, we only get 18 million that's nothing. Alaska, 12 million. Washington, 11 million. All these West Coast states. Oh, wait, California gets $3 billion. Florida, almost a billion dollars. 400 million for Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia. I mean, so there are some states where the space program has been spread out and they have massive NASA facilities that support massive white collar workforces that boy economies that get congressional district leaders elected. So if you take that money away, you have an unhappy Congress. So you can't take that money away. So NASA has to think, well, what do we do? We have to do something. So let's go back to the moon. It makes sense on a technical level because Apollo was a pinnacle of our success in terms of extra earth activity. For human exploration, but it also is not, uh, on one sense, going to grab the imagination of the population like it did in the 60s. So there's a balancing act they have to do. Um, why go back to the moon? Well, 
we do need to figure out how to live in a radiation environment like we talked about in Mars missions. So that's, a, that's technology that we have to come up with and figure out how to successfully implement space stations and vehicles that can stay in the extreme radiation environment of space for a long period of time and shield, you know, shield the astronauts, otherwise they'll perish. And then the cost of success. So spending a couple billion dollars here, a couple billion dollars there, and then achieving an objective while supporting, you know, a, a workforce in multiple states is a successful endeavor, both politically and visually to the population base of the country. If we do get to moon again, we are gonna have new technology. We'll have HD cameras, we'll have all sorts of cool things. It's gonna look cool, it's gonna feel cool, and it will be a, a, a pinnacle in NASA's hat. Also, part of the Artemis mission is to build a uh, lunar orbiting base called Gateway, and that will you know, that's a new technology that hasn't been created. We have one space station, the International Space Station. We've had a few before, Mir and Skylab, but those have all been protected by the Van Allen belts. They've all been in low Earth orbit. There's been no kind of deep space type living arrangement for humans. And then we can go back and refine what was successful in Apollo, right? Apollo achieved great success, and then we haven't gone back to that level since that point in time, which is a long time ago. And then political visibility. So what things we do need to be accessible and the population has to agree to it and want to do it. And so going back to the moon is an easy thing to try and justify, not only from a technology demonstrator side, but because it, it shows an achievement and a, and a modernization of our space capability. So So the moon base thing, I found this was pretty cool. Let's check this out. Make sure, tell me if you can hear it or thumbs up. The US Space Agency, NASA, is examining yeah, several good. design ideas for Gateway, the planned research outpost in lunar orbit. It will also be a temporary home for astronauts waiting to travel to and from the moon's surface, or perhaps Mars. The mock-ups look like balloons, but they are far more complex. The Gateway, which is a lunar, uh, staging ground where we're going to aggregate uh, the, the, the lunar vehicles to go to the lunar surface and then maybe in the future aggregate the Mars transit vehicle. So it's a sort of a co-orbiting platform and in, in, in lunar uh, vicinity. Inside the habitats are things needed to accommodate research as well as facilities needed for humans to live and work. Experts are studying the mock-ups to see which design works best. And the whole point is to define what we like and don't like about these different habitats. And, and from that, we will aggregate all the data and come up with recommendations and even requirements for what we actually want to go to flight with. The push to design and build space habitations grows out of the Trump administration's effort to have NASA put astronauts back on the moon by 2024. The accelerated timeline spawned the agency's Artemis program, which calls for the privately built lunar gateway, as well as lunar landers and robotic rovers. The modular space station orbiting the moon will house research and people. This gathering took place recently in Las Vegas, Nevada, at the headquarters of Bigelow Aerospace, a space habitat company founded by hotel chain billionaire Robert Bigelow. He hopes to host guests in a whole new way. Gateway is an opportunity to test all these structures and in a deep space environment, so to speak, even though it's so close to home, uh, as a prelude to going to Mars. Bigelow's B-330 habitat, launched from Earth compacted inside a capsule, is made of a fabric-like material designed to shield inhabitants from deep space radiation and high-speed space debris. Once docked alongside other gateway modules in lunar orbit, the habitat unfurls into a two-story, 16-meter-long outpost that can house up to six astronauts. The Lunar Space Habitat and Colonization Program is expected to cost more than a billion dollars through 2028. Jim Randall, VOA News. So it looks like, you know, we graduated from flying kites to gliders to flying in the biplanes to blimps to rockets and now we're back to blimps <laughs> but uh that's a pretty fun project i think the expandable modules probably is a really good idea because 
uh, hard structures either need to be built in space if they're larger than the radius of the launch vehicle, or they need to be able to attain their width uh, mechanically, or in this case, by being blown up from the inside. And would you like to live in a blimp in space? Hmm. We'll see. There's no windows, so I'm kind of like, hmm. It doesn't look. It doesn't look any more inviting than a cave in in Mars. So, I guess if they put a spar Starbucks on board, I'll be all right. So, back to the price tag. So, in the '60s, NASA's budget exploded when the country and the climate and the technology all kind of came together at one point in time. We were in the midst of the space race, so we're going to fund these rocket technologies either by the military or by you know NASA working with the military anyhow. We were going to try and achieve something great because the country you know was only less than two decades out from a major world war, so there's a reason to just band together to achieve something great. There's a, a lot of things came together, and then obviously when you had a president who was willing to take that kind of a risk and was able to magnanimously join everyone together, uh, you know, it became more than the sum of its parts. So, but let's take a look at the budget for NASA. At the peak in 1966 of NASA's funding, they were consuming 4% of the federal budget. So massive, massive amount of money thrown at this problem. And it did solve a lot of issues. If you look at today's funding of NASA, I think it's kind of sad. At least to me, they should be over 1%. It's an important agency and does so much for the world. People fail to realize how much uh, the Apollo program brought to the modern world. I mean, Modern plastics, modern computers, modern surgical instruments, modern optics, modern all fabrics, modern all that stuff is a kind of a byproduct of this money that we spent. So, I mean, I don't think it's a bad investment at all because I guess if you want to call it the trickle down, the technology trickle down was massive. So enough of the boring politics stuff. I'm sure you guys are falling asleep. Let's look at some heavy lift launch vehicles and their capabilities. Uh, this came out of a really good presentation by uh, the Everyday Astronaut. I don't know if anyone watches his channel, but for this one, he did a fantastic job comparing both the cost and the capabilities of the main heavy lift vehicles that we'll most likely see active both in the past and in our, in our future. Currently, the only one that actually works and flies is Falcon Heavy. And we can see that to get in its reusable state, which equates to a $90 million per launch, Falcon Heavy can put nine tons into lunar, translunar injection altitude. So that's, you know, a fair capability. And if you expend the vehicle completely, which adds $60 million to the cost, you could get 15 tons into translunar injection. Let's compare that with Saturn V. Saturn V could get 48.6 tons into translunar injection in one flight. So basically, you needed six Falcon Heavies to get the capability of one Saturn V. But six Falcon Heavies would cost you $50 million and one, I mean $500 million, sorry, and one Saturn V would cost you $1.2 billion. So if you could launch a bunch of Falcon Heavies and assemble this stuff in space and then go to the moon, that would be much more cost effective than these massive rockets like this. Now let's compare the space launch system, which is under development, and we're going to talk about a bit uh, this is the exciting, fantastic rocket with some flaws in terms of its timeline and cost. I'm not opposed to this rocket. It's amazing. Um, I just think they've done some stupid decisions and, and it's expendable. So at this point, this number right here really is false. These things cost about, at the end of this program, they're going to cost probably one and a half billion dollars per launch. So 
they haven't even launched yet. And the first block target is going to have capability of putting 27 tons into translunar injection, which you can see still doesn't come up to Saturn V's capability. And then in its block 1B phase, it's going to be able to put 43 tons into translunar injection. So this is single, single launch capability. So the whole Orion capsule plus the service module plus all the fuel and everything they need to do the lunar mission is in one launch. And then if we compare with uh, Starship, which is not uh, fully worked out yet, but the SpaceX is putting almost all their efforts into actually making this happen. So we can expect something of this sort will happen at some point in time. Um, the expectation is that it's going to have 40 ton capability and $100 million per launch. So that's really cost effective, fantastic system, should be really good. It's not reality yet. This is basically a reality. Uh, they don't have one to launch yet, but the core stage is done. The, the boosters are tested, everything. So this, this will be a reality in the near future if it doesn't get canceled. So I don't want to brag on SLS. SLS is cool. So let's watch this cool movie. This I thought this was amazing. They did a slow-mo camera of one of the solid rocket boosters test firings. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of mesmerizing, huh? So they left the plug in one of the boosters and just shot it off like it's a cannon. Sometimes working for NASA would be pretty cool just to go blow stuff up and shoot things across the valley. All right, so the SLS planned vehicles goes like this. We've got the block one going to block 1B. So I think they're actually just going to go straight to block 1B at this point in time. Oops. You see what I mean? Shows your thrust levels on the bottom, maximum thrust levels. It also shows your payload, your translunar injection payload capability, and the final payload capability for the final block to cargo is 45 tons translunar injection. So that's the equivalent of right now having 15 tons or eight tons in reusable mode falcon heavy so if we have eight it's the same thing we need to fire off about six of these to get one of those but there's some problems with sls the original cost 2011 said the program would take about 18 billion dollars and they'd be launching in 2018 in 2018 there's a nice audit because no one was launching anything boeing was not on time and was 40 percent over budget they cut the Block 1A and other projects in 2014, and it still didn't yield any cost savings. And congressional districts with the SLS facilities fought hard to keep the money and not cancel the whole program. And in the end, at this point, it could be up to $2 billion per launch. If you spent $2 billion on Falcon Heavy launches, you could get 20 of them, which is 160 tons in TLI, but you still have to assemble it in space. So. It's not that it's not a necessary situation. It's just the cost is ridiculously high. So let's get off ragging on SLS and take a look at the Orion capsule, the other, the other portion of Artemis. The Orion capsule is actually really fascinating and very, very functional vehicle. Um, this is the whole system. We've got the launch abort. It uses the classic launch abort system with a rocket on top pulls the capsule away in case of a failure. This is what was been developed from about the 50s. 
you'll notice all the new ones like the uh, Blue Origin and the SpaceX, like the Dragon capsule that just launched today, their launch abort is integrated into the maneuvering and positioning system. So they've got a separate system for launch abort, which is more efficient, less weight. You don't have to, you know, cast this into the sea kind of thing. And then we've got the service module. That's the other portion. It's pretty cool. Crew module, crew module adapter, service module. Nice, full, huge system. Oh, and here we got this test. This is this is the good stuff. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition. And this is the LC. And it's our launch vehicle is carrying the AA2 launch abort system for a full stress test. Get ready for it. 15,000 feet. see the abort. Abort initiation. Pyros 1 and 2 discharge both sides. Richie for pressure. Good control. It would be a little odd to be in this capsule and know that you've got four rocket motors pointed at you. I thought the amazing Check. camera work on this one is so cool. Pyros and there it goes. Discharge both sides. Good power enabled. So if you were uh, going to go up on SLS and ride the Orion, that would be what saves you if the vehicle experienced an so anomaly there goes the LAS. launch. Tumbling a bit, Orion coming down. Start Everything a data looking rebroadcast. Good so far. Recall there are no parachutes on this test today, so once the data recorders have been deployed and the vehicle is no longer transmitting data, TC will call test complete. So it goes and we're looking now at the Orion on and they didn't even recover written. the capsule because we're about to get ejection of those EDRs. This I thought was pretty cool. Uh, so the capsule's ready. Um, that Orion system is complete. Just recently, because of all the delays in SLS, NASA and congressional budget people got together and considered launching the Orion capsule on either a Delta IV Heavy or Falcon Heavy. But in the end, politics again, you know, felt that if they did start to switch directions, there would be no going back and SLS would be canceled and uh, you'd lose, well, their argument, their argument is that you'd lose the for the single lift capability, but really what they'd lose is all the money in their congressional districts. So it's cool to see this thing. The whole Orion pressure vessel only has seven welds. Like each of these are either extruded or pressed. And then you literally could build this by welding this piece to that piece, taking these three extrusions and welding the seams welding that to the top, and then taking this and welding it to the barrel, and then put a can lid on it. So that's pretty cool. Seven welds, that's all that's done for the whole pressure vessel. All right, so to finish off for Artemis, let's talk about what the mission is. The proposed mission for Artemis is really cool. It's gonna have a lot of different components. This hopefully will actually happen. I'm all for seeing us, you know, make this happen as well as, you know, letting SpaceX try and go to the moon too and have Blue Origin go to the moon. Everybody should be doing more and more rockets. But keep in mind, this is the proposed mission. And right now it's proposed for 2001, which will probably be delayed again, either by the pandemic or something at Boeing or, you know, so I would expect maybe 2022 when you'd see this mission actually come together. But we have launch from Florida, you can see North America here, South America, taking off, coming up, 
and then we get into uh, Earth orbit. So once you're in Earth orbit, you can you position yourself, do your systems checks, get everything ready to go. And once you get to a certain point where the moon and the Earth are in the right alignment, you go ahead and fire off your main engines. And this is what we call the translunar injection burn. Also, at this point for this Artemis 1 mission, it's kind of cool. They're going to have a bunch of piggyback satellites, 10 to be exact, which are going to then follow along Artemis. They're going to be ejected after the translunar injection burn. And that package will then go into its own uh, moon orbit or other orbits. They can use the moon's gravity as a piggyback or a, a well to shoot it off into space. Um, so then once you're traveling to the moon, it takes a few days, you get to the moon and you come in at this kind of interesting angle where you're gonna do a really low altitude flyby which means your velocities increase quite substantially. Maximum velocities reach down here. And then you come back around. And this enters into your positioning, what's called the distant retrograde orbit, so DRO. And you're now in this retrograde orbit around the moon for the endeavor of your stay at the moon. Uh, by the way, retrograde means that from our viewpoint, we would be going around faster than we'd see the spaceship going around. So from our perspective, it would look like it's going backwards. Once you're done with your mission, all by the way, all this Artemis 1 mission is uncrewed. So this is just a test of all the systems. So you can imagine how complicated this is. And yet there's no astronauts on board. So you get ready to do what's called the DRO departure, which means you at the maximum velocity when you're right down here. That's why you enter into these low, these low orbits. Uh, you fire your main engines again, which gets you out into return power flyby RPF. And then you get into your trajectory correction and you're on your way back to home. And of course, once you get near Earth, you start to drop your altitude, you let the atmosphere slow you down, you go into the full re-entry burn, and then parachutes and splash down. So that's the whole Artemis mission, the first one, and hopefully we get to see it happen. Can't wait, but I'm not holding my breath because as again, we talked about Artemis is beset from politics. So, we do have a competitor for this, and that's the SpaceX Starship system, which yesterday, Starship number four did its uh, fifth uh, test. They filled the vehicle up, fired the main engine, it fired off quite nicely, and then after the test, there was some anomaly with one of the, one of the lines, apparently, and you get an amazingly beautiful, though quite catastrophic, uh, deconstruction of the vehicle. Um, don't worry, this vehicle was built in about a month and a half, and it's number four because its predecessors experienced similar fates. And in front of it is Starship number five and Starship number six already complete, which took even less than a month and a half to build. And uh, so the way that SpaceX does development and the way that Boeing does development and NASA is two different eras. SpaceX is going back to like the quote unquote good old days of the 50s when they continually would just test to destruction to find what was wrong with it and then do, do better in the next round. I don't know, Martin, this is uh, Jerry Blackner. I wonder if it's alluding to the fact that we had to use the Russians to launch into space or something. Ah, uh, yes. So 
this is the boondoggle of the thousands where everyone realized that uh, the space shuttle system was not as safe as they intended and cost way, way, way more than they intended. It was supposed to be a cheap truck to drive things up into space and come back and be very safe. But it turns out it's one of the most complicated engineering systems we ever created. So uh, they decided to go in a new direction. And instead of going in a new direction while already having a capability of getting us uh, you know, seats to the International Space Station, they decided that they just rely on their Russian partners for a few years. They contracted out the rides for, you know, a number of years at a, at a really reasonable rate. And they are like, we can get, uh, you know, we can get our space launch system going and have the capability to you know, put humans in space again right away. And of course, that's not what happened because we had different administrations and different congressional leaders come in and argue and fight over NASA funding. And you have all sorts of different elements that come into play with that. So if that's what you mean, yeah, our human launch capability at NASA diminished greatly when we lost the shuttle program. But And I love the shuttle, but it was a flawed um, endeavor from the get-go. So um, it's not that it's... I mean, it's sad to see it go, but it's it wasn't it wasn't as safe as planned, and it cost way, way, way more than uh, the equivalent. Uh, you know, just shooting a rocket up. Hope that answers the question. I just wanted to know if there was any automated science on Artemis One that's planned. Right. So Artemis One's going to have a full complement of science packages, definitely. And they have that piggyback mission that goes with it. Most of those will be science-based, and uh, you know they're going to they're going to test all of the technologies that are integrated. Even though Orion One looks like a enlarged, um, you know, Apollo capsule, it actually is a really really uh, sophisticated new vehicle. It's, it's pretty interesting, and and it's a it's a next technologic step forward. Even though it's still using kind of the old school heat shield reentry burn type of uh, uh, you know, technology for getting it back to Earth. So yeah, there's going to be Artemis One will be fascinating to watch. We'll get, you know, it should be cool to have HD cameras flying over the moon inside a vehicle. Just gonna be really good. There's a comment from the Dashi family. It does not seem like very good odds for Starship. Uh, <laughs> Starship is going to happen. Whether it takes three or four more of those types of destructive uh, tests um, will definitely, you, I'll, I'll guarantee that at some point this year, not only will the Starship be flying, but they'll probably get it up into a, a, a high altitude as well. Um, whether that system arrives looking like it does right now or whether or not they, they morph into something else uh, is to be determined. Um, but I guarantee you with the amount of effort that SpaceX is willing to pour into that particular facility and system, we're going to see some form of Starship launching in the very near future. Keep in mind, these are the people that in California built a, a whole facility, built a whole huge die, the largest carbon fiber wrap die in the world, uh, started wrapping it with carbon fiber, calculated out the costs of what would happen to build 50 of them and scrapped the whole thing. So they probably spent hundreds of millions of dollars just to do that, to find out that, oh, we need to do something that's cheaper and more effective and went in a whole other new direction, just almost as if they just on a whim said, oh, that technology sucks, let's try something else. So they, they're, Willingness and ability to stomach that kind of um, R&D funding is is amazing in this day and age because most companies wouldn't be able to do that. But as it said, Elon started SpaceX just so he can go to Mars. So that's their whole thing. Dragon uses the same technology as the uh, Dragon Cargo. So it deorbits itself. It does, you know, use... It's burn. It has actual engines on it, unlike maybe like Apollo, which just has kind of maneuvering type engines. So it can deorbit itself quite quite quickly, and then it does do a uh, 
you know, a, a descent burn, much like the Apollo capsules or anything. So it has heat shielding on it and it comes right back down, splashes down in the ocean. And a lot of that's just due to the fact that uh, the amount of fuel you need to carry to do like what the boosters do, like SpaceX this morning when it relanded its booster, you saw it had a boost back burn. If you have to do that from space and power your way back to Earth, you have to carry a lot of fuel and carrying all that fuel is just a waste of energy. So It was drone technology, right? Of course, I Still Love You is a platform where no one is on board. It has a tugboat that sits, uh, I think, 15 kilometers away from it. So it's outside of the uh, expected uh, target zone. What's interesting is Falcon 9 is actually in its targeting. It's targeted to land not at that landing pad. It's targeted to land in the ocean right off to the side until the last like 20 seconds. And at the last 20 to 15 seconds, then it reorients itself and lands on the landing pad. So it actually is designed to not uh, destroy its own landing pad. Same thing happens when it comes back to Florida. The, their, their initial guidance and targeting is like just off the coast so that it won't actually land in someone's neighborhood or destroy a shipping port or whatever. So it's pretty cool stuff. I mean, you could call it drone technology in the sense that it has you know, multiple IMUs, inertial me measurement units, and it has GPS, you know, positioning. It, it has all the same things that it's, it's basically the same thing like what's in your phone. And uh, then it just has a whole decision matrix that it goes through. No, all of that's automated. No human would be able to react fast enough. <laughs> in the sense that other countries copied our technologies. Um, I mean, basically you had, in the space race, you had two different technologies, the, you know, the USSR and the United States. And we went in two different directions, fundamentally, mostly in the sense of the engines, you know, the fueling and the engines used, and then in the scale of the engines versus the quantity of the engines. So. Um, basically everyone else ever since then has copied either one of those ideas. And even, you know, you can see the difference between Delta and Falcon. Falcon uses nine engines and Delta uses a couple, you know, so, um, it's basically at this point, uh, both technologies are copied and, uh, everyone would use either one. Roscosmos and NASA work very well together. Uh, Putin and Trump don't. So I think your question is probably um, there's there is competition and but there's also a lot of cooperation in terms of the science and technology. Roscosmos and NASA are on board, you know, working together in terms of funding levels and what's being developed. It's the Russians are, they're behind the Chinese, they're behind the Indians at this point. They're, they're basically just building the same old 1950s, 60s technology over and over again. Falcon Heavy could launch the Orion capsule to space. Falcon Heavy could launch the service module to space. Falcon Heavy could not launch both of those at the same time to space. Um, I think the next big advent in tech is going to be um, refueling in low Earth orbit. And that's probably going to happen from SpaceX's side in a, in a, in a couple of years once they have their, you know, their system going. I mean, they're directly wanting to have launches where they just take fuel up into low Earth orbit and then take big rockets up and refuel them in low Earth orbit and then go to Mars. So. <laughs>
always a fun one. Um, and this will conclude our whole three-part space series. I can't conclude the space series without talking about Space Force. Space Force is in the news. Also, it's a new Netflix thing or whatever. Um, it is a actual branch of Air Force now, actually standalone. And um, I put down War of the Robots because what Space Force is doing right now, and probably for the foreseeable future, you're not going to see guys in exosuits with laser guns in the middle of space shooting at each other or giant Gundams firing away at each other. Uh, it's just not efficient. And in the environment of space, the things that are efficient are robots. Right now, mostly we're talking about satellites, but uh, each satellite, in a sense, is a remote operational me mechanical vehicle. So I call them all robots. So Space Force, War of the Robots, which is a better description than just about anything else. So Air Force Space Command is made up of quite a number of people. Surprising when I researched it. Um, 2,000 military personnel, uh, 9,000 civilians. And its main mission is to provide resilient, affordable space and cyberspace capabilities for the Joint Force and the nation. Uh, if you go into what they actually do, most of the money they get is to uh, operate and launch and maintain the capabilities of satellite systems. Here are a list of some of the satellite systems that Space Force is in charge of. Some of these, uh, if you go look them up, you won't find much about them because, well, they're classified. Uh, most of these cost billions of dollars. So you're looking at billions and billions of dollars right here. Uh, some of these I know a little bit about. Some of these I know nothing about. So. Defense, defense Satellite Communication System. Well, obviously that's gonna be comms for the defense part. This Defense Meteorologic Satellite Program. Now this is interesting. You and I benefit from this. So these satellites are highly advanced um, weather satellites strictly for the defense department, but they do share their wind data and their some of their you know spectral rain and cloud and stuff, that type of data. They'll share that with NOAA. So it's integrated into our weather observing system, both on the civilian NOAA side, so it's, I mean, on the government side, uh, not Defense Department, and, uh, and, and so they have a, a really good sharing program so that our weather systems are enhanced greatly by the billions of dollars we spend on this. I don't even know what the Defense Support, support Program is. Fleet Satellite Communication Systems, that's pretty interesting because it's at UHF, so ultra high frequency. Ultra high frequency is, uh, you know, in, in pre-microwave type system, so, you know, up in the 400, 900 megahertz type thing. Um, global positioning system, so, yep, they're in charge of our GPS stuff. Milstar, NATO 2 and 4, NATO 3 and 4 communications. And space, space surveillance, that's the cool part. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, because some of that's not declassified, but we know a little bit about what's going on. So just as an example of one of their satellites, got the space-based satellite system. They had a test of that system, 2010. Cost 832 million, just the satellite alone, built by Ball Aerospace. And it checks on every active spacecraft in geosynchronous orbit once per day. So this one almost billion dollar satellite is designed to go up there and just inform the Space Force of what all the other geosynchronous satellites are doing every day. Huh. So it's like we're spying on the spies. This is an example of type of satellites that we use, uh, communication satellites, so it's a nice picture. Also, the Air Force has this beauty, which is completely classified what the payload is, and no leaks have actually come out about what the payload is, which is surprising because there's two of these. Uh, there's actually prototypes, there's probably more, uh, but one is basically always in orbit. 
This is one of the vehicles that's been in orbit and returned to Earth over the longest period of time. I think they left one of these up there for more than two years. Um, it's a space truck, like the shuttle. You can see that it kind of looks like the shuttle. It's a delivery and recovery vehicle. What does it take into space? No one knows. We do have a cool video of testing it. Um, this is before it actually uh, was deployed. The best landing I got for this, which I, I forgot where another landing was, but it was at night, so I didn't, I didn't show you that video. But if you go on YouTube and look up X-37, there's some really good videos of them. The scales of men walking around, checking it out. All right. I love watching these things. It's fantastic stuff. So they release it high altitude it's autonomous there's no one in the cockpit because there's no cockpit or flight deck <clears throat> it's flying pretty fast there for a landing it's kind of cool sets itself down just like the shuttle Isn't that a crazy perspective? Some pretty hot landings for the, any of the pilots on board with this. Uh, they'll be looking at that going, wow, that's coming in fast. So in essence, Again, from the very beginning, it's robots, the war of the robots. Well, if you think about it, this is just an automated vehicle. Uh, it's another part of the automated systems that most of what's going to happen in space in terms of Space Force or you know, satellites attacking satellites, or there'll be a war of resources at some point when we have the capability to go out and mine asteroids and have to divvy up and decide who owns what in space and who gets to utilize those resources and usually when humans uh, have access to resources they tend to fight over it so if any of you are thinking uh, going into the Air Force and you want to work on something really cool. Well, Space Force is calling you. There's some very, very, very cool projects they, they work on in Space Force, that's for sure. This one was really cool too. So this is a DARPA uh, project, uh, obviously under the, under the direction of space-oriented stuff. And they wanted to build a robot that would go up and either attach onto a satellite or inspect a satellite or actually fix a satellite if they could, like this one, or saying, wow, the solar panel did not release. All I have to do is clip the zip tie that somebody left on and poop, there it goes. So yeah, I'm sure it's not quite that simple, but basically that's what that looks like. That type of satellite ended up actually being built, uh, not with the little robot arms, but they do have a version that has little robot arms. And uh, it was Northrop Grumman who's first to build it and launch one. This is the MEV-1. And this is literally what happened. This is literally a picture from that satellite that launched and orbited itself next to a communication satellite that had run out of fuel. So when a communication satellite runs out of fuel, it needs to move out of its orbit and go to a uh, graveyard parking area before it runs out of fuel. Otherwise, it could be a hazard for other live satellites. So they have zones where they park dead satellites. 
well, this one was going to be put into the graveyard and the MEV literally has this probe. This is actually the, uh, the engine, so the rocket engine of that communication satellite. So here's that communication satellite. Here's its engine. And this MEV is literally just taking its probe and sticking it right up into the engine's nozzle and connecting to it. And then it has its own actual maneuvering engines. And now it's made that satellite able to stay in position and operate for another service lifetime. So how cool is that? Robots in space. So the last part of this is what happens if we do have a little war in space and people start shooting each other? Um, it's not a good thing, right? Uh, we're going to show a little video of the only known instance when two satellites actually did collide. This is in 2009. The Cosmos 2251 satellite collided with Iridium 31. It's a direct hit. And this animation is amazing. It's done by a huge, huge supercomputer. So what you're looking at is a simulation of most of the large objects uh, that are in orbit. So this actual simulator can click on and off any of the orbiting objects around the Earth. So right now what it's just showing is the two satellites, the Iridium. And so right here shows all payloads orbiting Earth right now in white. And the blue ones are US payloads. So here's when the collision happens. Happens up north. Kind of gives a slow motion of what they think the collision looked like. So these collide at such a high rate of speed that basically it just Anything that hits anything else turns into microparticles, and then those microparticles have velocity that just shreds the rest of the vehicle. So you basically end up with just a big debris cloud. What I found fascinating when I watched this is watch what happens. So all of those pieces of debris then are in orbit. The ones that are shot, shot down towards the Earth actually burn up in the atmosphere. The ones that are shot into outer space leave Earth's orbit. Look what happens. All of those, after they collided and exploded, they're all free objects orbiting the Earth. So they all then don't have, by Newton's law, there's nothing else acting upon them. They don't have any engines. There's nothing. Every single one of those particles comes right back to the exact same spot where the two satellites collided. I, when I saw that simulation, I was like, whoa, that's so cool. What a difference when you can see it. You know, you have a, a visualization of what really happens. So again, what happens, the two satellites collide. Massive amounts of energy go into all little particles, shifting them off just like bowling balls or cue balls or whatever, going all different directions, right? But every particle that leaves the collision is now just in a free orbit. It's not the same orbit as the satellite itself, but it's in a free orbit, and it's going around the Earth. And because it's in a free orbit, and it hasn't started processing yet, all of those in the first few orbits come right back to the exact same spot and, and go right through. And I guess, again, going back to the main point, um, that's a lot of debris. And some of those pieces are moving at very high velocity. So, if you had another satellite that you know, got in the way of that debris cloud, well, it just might explode as well. So the problem that has been proposed is that if there was a war in low Earth orbit uh, between a bunch of satellites, that you'd end up with a kind of a cascading effect where the particles themselves would hit other objects and make more particles. And after only a short period of time, you'd have a certain zone in Earth orbit where no one could transit because it would just be full of debris. And it's, a, it's called a catastrophe at that point. So they're going through showing um, actual um, 
amounts of debris that remained in orbit. They're showing uh, the number of pieces of debris that were detected by NORAD. You can see here's where the space-based radars are. There's the one in Alaska, there's the one out there, there's one in California. Um, so these are, are all the X-band radars that were in the flight line of this debris cloud. And it shows, when you see a big blue circle, that shows them picking up actual debris. And they're just running those actual data points against the models. So you can see right here where they're picking up actual detection of the debris cloud. And then you can tell, look at how many payloads are out there in orbit. This is, the red is amazing because that's all tracked objects. So with this type of a picture, it looks like there's a whole cloud of junk, of space junk already, already orbiting the Earth. But obviously those particles are very, very small and that zone is huge. So um, there's a lot of particles, but the chance at this point of you actually colliding with one is not that high. And some of the smallest, smallest particles, they don't carry much energy because they don't have a lot of mass. All right, I think that's the last slide. And I think that's probably right on time. So we can have a couple questions. And this concludes the space section of the WINGS AE provision to cover everyone's contact hours in your squadron. If you haven't been able to get some good AE, come here, watch this. We're going to uh, probably continue with a new series and it's going to be aviation based. We'll have more information about that later, whether we do three part, I think we'll probably do another three, three month series on aviation. So you'll get my love of aviation perspective, which is obviously unique and bizarre. Um, is it possible for the particles to cover all of Earth over time? Right. So you have to think of it in terms of zones. Um, like those two collided and you can, you can see if you go back and watch the animation again, um, that a lot of the particles go up into higher orbits, which actually probably have an escape velocity or a, re a degrading orbit because it'll come back too close to the Earth's atmosphere, or they directly get sent down into the atmosphere. So over time, what happens is uh, the particles that you're worried about stay in a stable orbit or a cloud at a certain height above the Earth's surface. So yeah, we do run the threat because a lot of satellites have different low Earth orbit zones where if something were to happen, there is a zone where you'd have pretty stable uh, orbits over long periods of time that uh, would end up being basically a junk layer covering the whole Earth. Uh, again, it, it's more like the plastic, uh, the plastic in the ocean, the the tons and tons and tons of plastic is out in the North Pacific. But if you take a boat and you go try and find it, uh, it's it's almost impossible. But that's because it's such a large area. In a way, would any conflict over space resources make space travel more difficult because of the subsequent debris? So, Space travel should be fine in the sense that the first like commercial space travel you're going to see is probably the vessel that we saw lift off today, Crew Dragon. That's a private vessel. That's contracted from NASA, but built by a private company. They're free to take that same exact vessel, build a bunch more, and for you, giving them a however million dollars, plunk you in a seat and you get to go into orbit. So the first commercial space travel will be probably in that exact vessel. Um, those things are pretty well shielded from micro impacts uh, because they're in, a, in essence, they're disposable vehicles in the sense that they're gonna, well, they try and reuse them, but they're built to withstand the launch from Earth's atmosphere. So they're shielded from the atmosphere. They're built to withstand going into zero gravity, zero pressure. So you're not gonna worry too much about the particle level right now. And also 
the tracking information for large particles is provided to all of the uh, the satellite operators and the, the people who will fly in these spaceships. So they'll know where the large objects are that need to be avoided. Now, microparticles over time could be an issue, and that's something that they've seen on both the International Space Station and other things where you get you go out and you look at a solar panel and it's got a little millimeter hole in it, right? And that's probably where a little piece of debris went flying through there at Mach 50 billion and just uh, punched a hole straight in. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, the tourism part and fight over resources, the fight over resources is, from my perspective is gonna be, um, if is there something to mine on the moon? Yeah, we'll have to divvy up the moon, but so what, it's pretty big. The fight over resources is gonna be like, who gets access to this asteroid, right? No one owns an asteroid. And let's say they do find an asteroid that's just completely platinum or has huge amounts of cobalt or something like that. You know, It's going to be, in essence, in today's markets on Earth, it would make you a trillionaire in 10 minutes. So um, it's valuable It's if it becomes easy to get at and private companies or countries try and go after it. There's going to be a fight for those resources at some point. There's a clarification question on whether or not the Space Force is under the administration of the Department of Air Force in the same way that the Marines are under the Navy. You know, I don't exactly remember. Like, they originally were just a uh, branch, but I think they're their own thing now. And I'm not sure who they come directly under at this point. Because it just, it just did change recently. Yeah, last year, I think, is when it changed. So. And my slide deck might be slightly old, so <laughs> I may have got that. <laughs> yeah, well, even I, I, I was just trying to find a quick answer um, on that from the spaceforce.mil site. And at the, at the beginning, it says it's part of the Department of the Air Force, but then towards the, the you know, scrolling down the page, then they say that they, um, they are sort of their own. So it's it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. Yeah, and I know that like for some of the missions, they're working with NRO, they're working with, you know, they're working with uh, ONR, they're working, f they're working with different agencies that probably keep their own intelligence closely held to themselves. So I'm sure there's areas where it's got, you know, compartmentalization happens in that, in that realm. So. Yeah, hey, Martin and uh, our I'm sorry, Major Giles, uh, I can chime in a little bit on that. Jerry Black. Yeah, here. definitely. Yeah, it was established December 20th, 2019. Um, U.S. Space Force established within the Department of the Air Force, meaning the Secretary of the Air Force has overall responsibility for the Space Force under the guidance and direction of the Secretary of Defense. Additionally, a four-star general known as the Chief of Space Operations serves as the senior military member of the U.S. Space Force. The CSO uh, is a full member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So that was the big change, right? That, okay, yeah. now I remember, right. So now yeah. they have a seat at the Joint Chiefs, that's right, okay. But that's they're correct. still part of the Air Force. The United Nations is an interesting animal, yeah. Um, it is, in some ways a very good area to hammer out your details and like take Antarctica for instance or you know Admiralty law um, Admiralty law means what happens in international waters um, so and also it's an effective way for you know smaller countries to have representation but in essence um, it is not going to have teeth when it comes to like what we're talking about fighting over asteroids uh, they have very little um, ability to force uh, countries, either whether small countries that are quote unquote rogue or large countries that just say, well, I don't care what you think, I'm going to do whatever I want. So they don't have the, uh, they don't have the ability to enforce the kinds of agreements that all the people, you know, kind of come to. So there's really good and bad things about it. Um, hopefully that the space uh, agreements can be more uh, open and we can 
not end up fighting over resources and we all have the we all have the goal of wanting to preserve humanity well at least some of us have the goal of preserving humanity and trying to <laughs> move forward <laughs> i shouldn't say we all do right because <laughs> there are there are forces in this world who are very only self-focused and would care less whether the rest of us have any say at all so but for the most part i i i think that what you're pointing to is that you know are we going to end up like, like a starfleet federation or something like that um there will be at some point you know like nato or agreements where the larger companies with the influences that they have primarily the space capable countries are going to uh, want to divvy up and take a big piece of the pie and that's what's going to happen my, my guess any other questions nothing else in the uh, chat box uh, there's a link to the spaceforce.mil site being shared by colonel blacketer uh, lots and lots of thank you uh, to Major Giles for these presentations. I'm sure I could speak for everybody. We're looking forward to the next series. Yes, yeah, it should uh, be fun. I think that everyone, at least I pulled my squad in two, and I think everybody is, you know, we all love airplanes and aviation and aircraft, so let's just dive into it. <laughs> Martin? Yes. Okay, uh, I want to compliment you. The timing of this presentation right after the uh, Dragon launch was really cool. The segue it was outstanding. I don't know how you pulled it off, but my congratulations. He, he messed up the weather the other day. <laughs> yeah, I used I used my I used my Tesla coils hidden in New Mexico uh -huh. and tweaked the weather. <laughs> well done. <laughs>